Coming up on episode 12 of Omnivore, overcoming innovation obstacles in post-pandemic food service, food brands that are fighting climate change, and an inspiring look at this year's Global Food System Challenge winners. This is Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's Concierge Membership Service. Save time, money, and people power with the Concierge Membership. Find out more at ift.org slash concierge membership. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. Food service accounts for half of every food dollar spent in the United States. Yet from COVID shutdowns to labor shortages and supply chain failures, recent years have not been kind to the restaurant industry. Food service operators looking to innovate and keep food front and center have had to be creative and nimble like never before. Food Technologies Deputy Managing Editor Kelly Hensel spoke with certified research chef and consultant Allison Rittman about the drivers shaping today's food service innovation pipelines. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today, Allison. I know that you gave some great insights for our menu innovation article, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. So uh, you did talk about the importance of food service operators and the relationships with their ingredient suppliers. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that dynamic and those relationships has changed since the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for the invite to be here. I do think that the relationship with um, vendors and operators has changed quite a bit since the pandemic. I think there were a lot of people who had very transactional relationships with vendors. I need this right now. You happen to have the best price. I'm going to go with you. And it really has to evolve based on the pandemic and based on the situation of, hey, we need multiple suppliers. We need a consistent supply. We need somebody that we can trust. And so I think that that has now led to a more relationship-based um, relationship versus this transactional, I'm going to go with you because you're the best person at the time. So that partnership that's been established, if it wasn't already there, I think is a big impact. And I think that helps both sides be a little more communicative about what's the overall strategy long-term. Um, you know, how can we collaborate instead of it just being a one way you're you're giving me something that I need in the moment? What are some ways that food service operators can create new experiences for customers with a simpler palette of ingredients? You know, I, I think this is an interesting question. It's been something that we have been discussing for years. Everybody wants to know how to cross utilize ingredients. We call it make table magic. What can you do with what you have on the make table, but bring new life and bring new innovation? And that's, I think, really where chefs and colonologists shine, right? Bringing that innovation to the table, bringing to life something that you might consider mainstay and, and kind of old news. But how can we just make those um, ingredients shine in a different way? One thing that we found is really culinary techniques can help with that. So can we run vegetables that are on the make table uh, through an oven or through a turbo chef? And now we have roasted vegetables, right? So I think that, you know, the key is really thinking of it as not like what's a fat ingredient that we could bring in to work for, for this one LTO, but what's the overall strategy? Is it to bring in, you know, really bold flavors or spicy flavors and how can we cross utilize that? So obviously, especially in today's economy with, you know, a looming recession or hopefully not, but you never know. Um, how has value, the term value, what does it mean for consumers today in light of all of this? I think the value equation has really changed. And I think that sometimes we get stuck in the past and we think, okay, value means this to all consumers. And I think we're seeing a branch off of generational value equation, what that means to each generation. So one of the things that we're really seeing is that um, you have to think very differently than what we did in the 2008 recession. Value definitely does not mean put more food on the plate and fill up my belly 
and I'll be happy. And I think of that as value. Um, we really are now thinking of it by generation and who is that target consumer. So if we're targeting somebody like a boomer, um, we might think of ideas that are around boosting immunity or mental focus. And that's what value means to that group. It's not necessarily a coupon or a lower price or more food for the money. Gen Xers, we've seen a lot of collagen right out on the marketplace and all different things from functional beverages to supplements. And so I think that those kind of things, that means value to that generation, um, more around the functionality side. And then you look at millennials who really, and Gen Z, really have a big impact on the products that they purchase and they want to think about the bigger picture, environmental issues, sustainability, those kinds of concerns. And then looking at Gen Z, you know, it still has to be great flavor, but like, what's that newest, greatest thing that could mean value to that particular group. I think out of all of the groups, one thing to keep in mind for the value equation is that it still has to be convenient. So they might be willing to pay a little bit more if there's a convenience factor and that's their value equation. So I think the big idea is really that value does not mean lowering the price, which is great for operators because that's not <laughs> something that they can do right now or should be doing. For the rest of 2023, is there a food trend or a, maybe not even a trend, but a movement or even a dish or a use of something that you see that's exciting you? You know, I, I think of it as kind of a big picture idea that I get excited about. Somebody once told me decades ago that all the recipes in the world have been developed and you're just rediscovering them or reinventing them in a different way. And I really think that that is so not true. <laughs> and, and I love to prove them wrong and say, well, look, th these are things that we just didn't have the technology to do 10 years ago. And so I think the piece that excites me that I'm really looking forward to learning more about is the technology side. And it, it spans across all categories, all generations, all types of food products, all across the industry. Not all of it is relevant to what I do, but it's still something new and I'm continuing to learn, right? So it's that kind of education piece that you still have to keep doing as you grow. And seeing things like ultrasonic French fries, I just found that fascinating. Have I ever used that for a fast food chain, for example? No, but maybe one day, who knows, right? And on the food processing side, I think we think about all of these technologies, HPP, you know, has that been around for a while? Yes. But is it widely used and used to its fullest extent? Not even close. So I think the quality of products that those can provide, those kind of technologies can provide are just astounding. And there's, there's so many more things that are coming down the road, like MATS and MAPS technology, ultrasonic, as I mentioned pulse electronic field, cold plasma. There's just so many really interesting things that are going to change how we can develop products and the kind of quality and flavor that we can bring to the consumers that maybe it's just a little lacking in the very traditional heat processing that we do today. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point because that technology is always going to up the game in, in terms of, of what people can deliver and, and what consumers then expect. So yeah, this has been a really great discussion. I really thank you for taking the time, Allison, to talk through some of these ideas. Allison Rittman is a corporate chef and owner of Culinary Culture. She has over 25 years of experience in the food industry and is one of the first women in the United States to hold the title of Certified Research Chef. Learn more about the future of menu innovation as predicted by Allison and other experts, by reading the May issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment, but first, this word from our sponsor. IFT's concierge membership service is like hiring an on-call staffer to help your innovation, R&D, and product development teams move faster. Tap into your consultant budget to get what you need now. From curated research to expert connections, the concierge is in. Get access to an IFT technical concierge today at ift.org slash concierge membership. That's ift.org slash concierge membership. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. 
Does the idea of a snack cracker that fights climate change sound a little pie in the sky? You might think differently after hearing from Jennifer McKnight and Mark Izzo, co-founders of post-holding subsidiary Bright Future Foods. For the past several years, Jennifer, the chief marketing officer, and Mark, the CEO, have dedicated themselves to creating the Airly Cracker brand, where each box purportedly removes up to 21 grams of carbon from the air. The two co-founders shared the story of building the Airly brand, from farmer's fields to the factory, and now to the store shelf, with Food Technologies Executive Editor Mary Ellen Kuhn. Mark, I thought we could start with you. You have a PhD in food science and nutrition. So from the perspective of a scientist, what makes you a believer in the Bright Future Foods Carbon Reduction Initiative? Sure. So from the perspective of a scientist, what really amazed me is that the technology exists today to capture carbon in the soil. And the technology exists today then to actually grow food that removes greenhouse gas rather than emits it. So we set out, and when these preeminent scientists said this to me, the leaders in their field, I said, wow, they believe it can be done, let's give it a shot. We work with post-holding supply chain, right? So we're really good at grains. We've been growing them a long time. We're the makers of honey bunches of oats and we're very good at it, right? Have a lot of farmers in our network. So we were kind of able to take the best of the best farmers we had, and we were able to first model their farms and understand where are the high carbon capture potential farms, and then actually pay those farmers, contract their grains, go through an entire crop season, collect actual data, and then at the harvest, do the farm level life cycle analysis. And, and lo and behold, that first year, we found one farmer, one oat farmer in South Dakota, that actually was negative. And then we had a lot of guys who were like slightly positive, but uh, one that was negative. And then we knew it could be done. For, for me there as a scientist, the technology was there. This was a life cycle analysis performed by, you know, PhD research level people at a prestigious laboratory in this country. So I knew as a scientist, that's when I knew we got something here. Well, it really sounds like you put the science first, which is impressive. So I would love to hear, Jen, about how it all came about and how you decided to, to go with crackers. Yeah, so all the studies will tell you that people want to vote with their values and people want to be a part of the solution. But today, as a shopper, if you walk in the store and said, go find me a environmentally sensitive product, like, good luck. I mean, really, first of all, they're they're really not out there. And secondly, we're not helping the shopper find those. So as we thought about how we really packaged this up for Airly, you know, thinking about how we communicate that to the consumer was a really important piece of it. And then as part of that, to your question was, well, what food should it be in? And so we spent some time with consumers really uh, talking about where they would expect it to be and what foods are they interested in. And what we found was folks who tended to be uh, more interested in the environment actually are very heavy snackers um, across all different snack categories. And so it started to make a lot of sense for us to take those grains and look at the different snack categories that are out there. Crackers made a lot of sense because it's a fairly short ingredient deck. So when you think about creating a low carbon footprint product, the fewer ingredients and the more grain you can put in there, the more climate friendly that product can be. So crackers for us made a lot of sense as that first step in to introduce um, the idea of a product that can help heal the planet. Interesting. Well, I want to take us into the whole area of greenwashing, if I could, for a minute or so. This whole thing where people question the authenticity of a company's sustainability efforts and instead think, oh, they're just doing it for the PR value or to achieve some ESG goals. Mm -hmm. You both sound so passionate about this project. Is it frustrating to come up against attitudes like that? And how do you respond to it? We created Airly from day one with a mission of helping to reverse climate change. So, you know, aside from maybe what some other folks are doing as a marketing campaign, we designed this so that the product itself actually helps heal the planet. And I would say that's one thing that kind of distinguishes 
the creation of Airly. And the, the other thing that I would put out there is the man on the street. And I would encourage folks to do this and we're doing it differently is we put our carbon footprint right on pack. And so as a consumer or a shopper, if I wanna know the impact of a product on my body's health, I can flip any product and look at the nutrition fact panel. Uh, with Airly, you can do that with a carbon footprint as well. So I know there's, there's, it's an emerging space. There's a lot of different discussions out there about the right way to do it. But I, those are the two things that I would point out and encourage folks as, as we're thinking about cutting through the greenwashing, like just make sure that you're actually measuring and putting your impact on the product is one of the things that I would say Airly is doing differently. We've got this kind of best in class mentality. And that's why when it comes to greenwashing, I invite the conversations and I realize the only way we're going to get past mm -hmm. all this dialogue about greenwashing, which could destroy the, the, the effect of all these people trying to do good things in the marketplace, we, we have to have open, transparent conversations. And that's why the degree of transparency that we give on our product is so high. The back of our box kind of reads a little bit more like a high school science lesson than a typical back of a cart. And that's very, very, very deliberate. And our website is even more information. You can follow the journey of every box, how much carbon was emitted when we baked, how much carbon was emitted when we transported the crackers. And as Jen said, why shouldn't greenhouse gas be, be labeled on things? It's as important, I would say, this might be a little bit of a radical thought, but I would say it's as important to people's health as grams of fat is, because ultimately this impacts everybody the worldwide. So that's kind of, that's a really a piece of the disruption. A piece of the revolution is this, we put the, we put, we put our impact on pack and you can argue with that impact and you can say it's greenwashing, but we'll show you how we got there. And if you disagree, that's okay, but we put it on pack and nobody else is doing that. So I, I think that's a big piece of our, our, my conversation about greenwashing. I just tell people what we do and they tend to understand after you tell them all that goes into this, you tend, to, they tend to understand that it's just, it was well thought out. It's well documented. It's transparent. And it's, it's simple actually, because it's math. More than a year into this venture, has it been harder than anticipated or pretty much what you expected? And in either case, how so? So I will tell you, Mary Ellen, it, it, it has been harder. And when you look at at trying to accomplish things uh, in a lot of strategy, you always talk about external influences when you do a strategic plan and internal influences. So I will tell you what's been a lot harder than I had hoped have been the external influences. I've been very pleased with our, our internal capabilities, our, our science at the farms, the, 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 how the farmers are reacting and they're excited about, everybody's excited about the brand, the food's great. Um, I'll, that's all coming together. I've been disappointed at the external things going on when it comes to climate, that it's become such a, you know, people, they just argue about climate too much and they uh, keep going back to it. They roll up their sleeves and they do too little. And, and that's my message to the world. Get it together. Stop arguing. Stop talking. Let's get out there and make a difference. And everybody can can attack this thing from a different angle. And that I'm a huge believer in innovation. Obviously I have a PhD in food science. I've, I've been a scientist my whole life. We can innovate our way out of this thing from all the incredible carbon capture technologies to all the green transportation. And let's as a food industry do our part. That's what I want to see. And I think, you know, I'll build on that, like in terms of, you know, when you're starting a company, you're starting a brand, like they're gonna be a lot of hard days. You kind of expect that. I will say, what gets me so excited um, and where I continue to find the energy is to Mark's point, there's so much like debate, but when you cut through that and you get down to the level of the person, I'll, I'll give you an example. So when we first started this, you can imagine we're a new brand, we have no volume. And as we're sourcing suppliers, it, you know, we have no volume to give you an, oh, by the way, we're actually going to ask you for a lot of information that your other customers don't. So you can imagine like our suppliers maybe weren't so excited to be partnering with us on day one. And I remember talking to Chris Corbin, who's our, our third founder, is he was out there, you know, candidly using his personal relationships. That's the only way we could get suppliers engaged with Airly, you know, in the early days. 
But as soon as we created that first box, and as soon as people saw what we were trying to do, I think what gives me so much hope and energy is those same suppliers who wouldn't even take our phone calls are now reaching out to Chris saying, I see what you're trying to do. I have ideas for how I, you know, how we can help you with that. Like as much frustration as there is with all of the regulation debate, I think at the core, people want to be part of the solution. And like, that's what I lean on on the hard days is we're doing the right thing. And at our core, I think everybody wants to be part of this solution. Jennifer McKnight and Mark Izzo are co-founders of Bright Future Foods, which makes early crackers. To delve further into the brave new world of climate-friendly food brands, check out our cover story in the May issue of Food Technology Magazine. Since its debut in 2021, the Seeding the Future Global Food System Challenge has awarded more than $2 million in grand prizes and grants worldwide to entrepreneurs that are innovating technologies and processes to improve the global food system. We invited this year's winners to share in their own words how they'll use the funding to accelerate their missions. One of them is the Food Systems for the Future Institute, which capitalized on winning a growth grant in last year's competition to capture one of this year's quarter-million-dollar grand prizes for its work to automate the processing of black soldier fly larvae into animal feed in sub-Saharan Africa. FSFI's founder and CEO, Erthren Cousin, is the former executive director of the United Nations World Food Program. Food Systems for the Future, or FSF, as we commonly know, we are focused on equitably and sustainably transforming the global food system to ensure access to affordable, nutritious food for all. If you recall, when we received the growth grant last year, what we are working to achieve with the partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture in Rwanda is access to affordable eggs for children. Recognizing that we cannot scale up the commercial egg enterprise in Rwanda to make those eggs more affordable if we can't address the the feed challenge. Animals uh, in Rwanda, as they are around too many, in many places around the world, fed grains and the same grains that humans consume. And because soy is not grown in places like Rwanda, it means that they're importing soy for feed as well as for food. Uh, and the price is prohibitive for scaling up that commercial food system because the, the, the feed costs are so high. And so what we're looking to do with this Black Soldier Fly Larvae project is to take food out of the feed system using the very innovative Black Soldier Fly Larvae flour that substitutes for soy in the feed. And then that feed then becomes more affordable. And as a result, the eggs become more affordable. What is exciting now, with that growth grant, what we were able to do was to prove this concept through the additional landscaping work that we were able to do, the additional research that we were able to perform, the partnerships. We, with that growth grant, we entered into a partnership with the city of Kigali to become the off taker of their organic waste. This grand prize grant is taking the ideas that we were able to develop and the proof of concepts that we were able to develop from the growth and turning that into the actual, the actual tools that we will now use for the fundraising, the construction of the facility, and the initial operation of this facility. What this facility allows us to do is to leapfrog the African introduction of black soldier fly larvae into the food system to the same level of op opportunity that we are witnessing in the U.S. and Europe. What this grant does is acknowledge that automation on the continent is possible 
that large scale projects on the continent are doable and that leapfrogging technology to bring Africa to the same level of agricultural production that we are seeing, that we are witnessing in other parts of the world is achievable. Alongside FSFI, this year's second grand prize winner was Accesso, recognized for developing a market-based system to combat the spread of aflatoxin in Haiti's peanut crops. CEO Rob Johnson says social enterprise was key to fighting the deadly fungus. Accesso will use the Seeding the Future prize money to support an additional 5,000 farmers in Haiti. We will deploy our integrated and innovative system that addresses aflatoxin contamination from seed all the way to market. In addition to this work, we'll also use this funding to launch activities to support the maize value chain with a very, very similar intervention, which will help make maize, local maize, safer for consumers as well as more profitable for small farmers. This work is critically important now more than ever as smallholder farmers are on the front lines facing some of the world's biggest challenges from climate change to food insecurity to irregular migration. Small farmers need our help and with the Seeding the Future support, Accesso will be by the side of more farmers as their partner to a better future. The challenge also awarded $100,000 growth grants to three organizations that demonstrated that their innovation is viable and projected both scalability and high-impact potential. One recipient, London-based Smart Villages Research Group, constructs community-led solar power facilities that use energy as a catalyst for rural development in Africa. In some Ugandan communities, farmer profits increase by an average of 280%, and average crop yields increased by 32%. Dr. Anna Clements, Senior Engineer and Community Engagement Specialist with the organization, says the grant money will help fund more of these smart agri-centers in underdeveloped regions. Well, at Smart Villages Research Group, we develop and implement innovative technologies and systems for rural communities in the Global South, focusing on clean energy and agriculture, and taking a community-led, bottom-up approach to development. One of our current interests is developing and scaling up our smart agri-centres. The agricultural sector is huge in Uganda. About 70% of the population work at least partly in agriculture. Many rural farmers are also off-grid and lose up to 40% of their potential revenue due to lack of appropriate storage facilities and value addition services. So our smart agri-centers bring together renewable energy, infrastructure, and training. They use solar power to run a cold storage room to reduce post-harvest losses, as well as other productive use services tailored to the needs of the community. And we found these smart agri-centers have real impact. Monitoring our pilot installation over a year, we found that farmer incomes increased by a factor of nearly four times. Farmers' yields increased, costs decreased, uh, and there was significant reduction in post-harvest losses. So having completed nearly four smart agri-centers in Uganda with funding from Innovate UK, we will be using the funding from the 2022 Seeding the Future grant to continue our efforts in developing and refining the smart agri-center concept and to find new communities who can benefit from it. Specifically, we've started engaging with new communities and exploring how a smart agri-center could improve their livelihoods and we're improving the existing design based on that community feedback. We're monitoring usage of existing centers to understand exactly how farmers use the center, how they engage with it, how training could be improved. And we've embarked on some detailed testing of cold storage capabilities, testing various produce and different storage practices and working out how farmers can best engage with it. So these smart agri centers can improve livelihoods and lives in off-grid rural communities. InMed Partnerships for Children is another repeat winner. Having earned a seed grant in the first year of the challenge, which it used to develop 18 aquaponic systems in South America that combine soilless crop production with fish farming. Founder and CEO Linda Pfeiffer says that this year, InMed will use the growth grant to help test and scale up its program around the world. InMed Partnerships for Children was awarded a Sitting the Future growth grant for our InMed ACE, or Aquaponic Social Enterprise, which accelerates the deployment of InMed's simplified adaptable form of aquaponics food production 
through a hub and spoke scaling model where historically marginalized small scale producers themselves um, become satellite hubs to support new aquaponics farmers. And aquaponics is a combination of hydroponic crop production and fish farming in a, a closed symbiotic system that requires 90% less water than conventional farming. And it's very intensive, producing about 10 times as much in the same space. But the essential ingredients for success of the Inmet ACE are the trainings, technical assistance, links to markets, and access to financing that support this growing network of aquaponics producers through partnerships with governments, private sector companies, and research institutions. And we're currently implementing this model in five countries from the Amazon jungle to the Kalahari desert. And the network of small scale producers is expanding. Um, and this grant will allow us to bring together all of these partners from different sectors across continents to develop a solid plan and the tools for scaling the Inmet ACE sustainably, in including the most difficult hurdles that, that we face, like, for example, developing dependable markets for this growing number of aquaponics producers. And the objective is to dramatically increase global healthy food production at the local level in the face of climate change and ultimately transition millions of small scale producers from subsistence to sustainable livelihoods. Finally, the World Wildlife Fund was awarded a growth grant for its Farmers Post program, which leverages the U.S. Postal Service to deliver fresh produce from America's farms to homes around the country. Julia Kernick, Senior Director of Innovation Startups for WWF's Market Institute, says the money will help the fund continue its efforts to overcome pilot test challenges. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund, WWF as a whole, is an environmental NGO, so really looking to uh, safeguard uh, and protect biodiversity uh, across the world uh, and address, is certainly a large piece of that, uh, the environmental impact of all sorts of systems, in my particular case, around food and agriculture. Uh, so at the Markets Institute team, we look at food and agriculture as a whole to look at innovative strategies, trends, and ways to get involved to in improve the environmental footprint while also uh, aligning that with financially profitable solutions so they are scalable and, and sustainable in all senses of the word. It has been thrilling to get the growth grant. We had a seed grant as well uh, that allowed us to kick around the idea of Farmers Post, uh, which is looking at directly shipping food from farms to consumers. Uh, and that seed grant allowed us to explore the idea initially. And now with the growth grant, we're getting to move beyond the initial sort of ideation phase into performing consumer testing to better understand market size, willingness to pay, and program design, and then to actually get some early pilots into the field to test the logistics of shipping food from, from farm to consumer. Read more about these and other challenge winners in the May issue of Food Technology. You can also hear a panel of this year's Food System Challenge recipients join Seeding the Future Foundation's founder, Bernard Van Lingerick, on July 18th for a keynote discussion at IFT First in Chicago. Entries for the 2023 challenge are open from now until August 1st. To learn more, visit ift.org slash food hyphen system hyphen challenge. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT's Concierge Membership. Accelerate your product development and innovate faster with a concierge membership. Find out more at ift.org slash concierge membership. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine, or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. 
The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.